um, like monster analytics or something. Yeah. And I just could not, I mean, it just, just wouldn't work. So. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely going to, so the, the second half of the class tonight, we are going to walk through that for sure. So yeah, that should absolutely be resolved by the end of the night. Cool. Any other questions about uh, things from previous classes before we dig into new stuff tonight? All right. Awesome. Well, as I told you guys that are on the uh, the, the private class, we're going to stream part of the, the class to Facebook Live tonight. So if you're joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. Um, I won't be able to see your questions or anything. So you're welcome to kind of observe how these classes go and, and absorb some of the information that we're talking about tonight. Um, but if you have questions, uh, I won't be able to answer them, but you're welcome to sign up for the rest of the classes and uh, you know that'll give us a chance to talk a lot more and, and bring you up to speed and everything. So we're just gonna jump in where we are. This is a new section that we're starting tonight, a new six class series specifically focusing on social media. So it's a great time to jump in if you haven't taken any classes yet. Um, so we've got a couple of students uh, maybe another joining us shortly um, in-house and they'll be able to ask questions and you should be able to, to see them as well. And so um, if you're on the Facebook Live, you'll be able to see about the first half of the class tonight. So uh, we are talking about social media. We're talking about how to make social media work. Um, you know, I talked to so many authors who have concluded that social media is a waste of time. And in a lot of cases, they're right. You know, if you're not doing it correctly, if you're not uh, you know, generating any meaningful relationships with your readers and, and growing your platform, it is a waste of time. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not a way to do it right. Uh, so I'm gonna share with you some strategies to, to do this well so that your time is actually productive for you. Um, and I think if you employ these things, you are gonna see your audience build. Um, you know, I, I've never seen this not work. Um, so we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna start by just reviewing some of the kind of key concepts that we've talked a lot of that in the course already, but they're so important that, uh, that now that we're jumping into a new section, I wanna go over them again uh, so that all the pieces are there. So we're gonna start with the growth triangle. So every successful platform building campaign has three primary com components. And we have a small version of this up in the corner here, um, but, if, but if these three things are present, then it works. And if, these three, if one of these three things has fallen behind, then they don't work. Um, and these are all scalable. So, you know, if you, if you make them each a little bit better, then the whole triangle gets stronger. And if, if one lags behind, then it kind of draws everything back. So the first one is content. You got to have stuff out there in the world. The second is exposure. And the third is connection. So we have to put content out in the world. We have to put material that has value to somebody out into the world. Exposure, that material has to be exposed to new audiences. Uh, if nobody sees it, then the content doesn't do any good. And connection, when, when those audience uh, interact with your material, they have to have some way to maintain that connection going into the future, whether that's you know, connecting with you on social media or joining your mailing list or coming to an event, uh, meeting you in person, whatever it is, there has to be some way um, where they can they can stay connected to you. So you know, a great example is if you were dating. You are in so many ways you are forming relationships with your potential readers, with your fans. It's like you're dating them. Um, and so if you were dating, you would first have to you know think about how you put yourself together, right? Before you go out to meet people, you probably think about what what outfit you're wearing. You know how you're going to talk about your job and things like that. Next, you need exposure to new people. Right, there are likely not any people that you want to date in your house or apartment. So you need to go out and you need to get yourself in front of, of new people, whether that's at the coffee shop or the bookstore or the party or wherever it is, whatever your scene is. And finally, you need a, you need a connection point, right? If this person, if you meet somebody and, and they want to maintain this relationship or they want to you know, get to know each other better, you need some way to connect that, whether that's you know, trading phone numbers or uh, you know, trading email addresses or connecting on Facebook or whatever it is. So we, we've talked about this you know, in, in quite a bit of depth as we, set, as we set up our connection ladder, which we'll get back to in a moment as well. But there are a few things that I want to highlight tonight and just, just re refresh ourselves on. So the most important um, factor of your content is that you are consistently bringing value to your audience. And this is, this is so often where, where authors fail. And so we've talked a lot about generating expertise and finding a niche. Um, not, not because uh, you know, that's the only way to bring value, but so that you're generating an audience that connects with your value. Uh, you know, content that has value to my mom 
doesn't have the same kind of value to my niece, right? Because they're in different places. So by generating one kind of focus, one niche or one expertise um, with your, your audience or your brand, uh, you're able to consistently bring value to that audience. Um, and key is consistency. Uh, social media cannot be sporadic. Social media needs to be uh, engaging on, on a nearly daily basis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go into specific platforms later on this series. You know, what are the cultural expectations as far as Facebook versus Twitter and your blog and things like that. Um, but it needs to be ongoing and consistent. Um, if you're putting out Facebook content sporadically, you know, four posts today and then none for a month, you're going to have difficulty doing that. And then your exposure. So there are a couple of different kinds of exposure that we're going to get into platform specifically. Um, so the first one is organic exposure, um, which in the olden days we called earned exposure, but now we call organic exposure. And that's when new people are, uh, are finding your content through some kind of natural means uh, that doesn't cost you anything, but, but maybe someone is sharing your content to their friends. Maybe you've got great SEO in place. And so they're, they're Googling something and they come to your website because it comes up on Google listings. Whatever the case is, that's organic exposure. Uh, which is lovely, right? Because that, that demonstrates that we have a real value to our content um, and we're getting in front of new people. But secondly, we have paid exposure where we can you know, utilize some tools on each social media platform and even on your blog and things like that to reach new audiences by paying these platforms money. And at first that seems kind of repulsive to us, right? That we would have to pay you know, Facebook, for instance, money to show our content to people. But once you take a step back from it, it's really not that absurd. Um, if you were going to, let's say you're doing a, a book reading, right? And you were going to print flyers and go hand those out on a street corner somewhere. It would cost you money to print the flyers, right? And then it would take a bunch of your time to go stand on a street corner and hope that those flyers get into the right hands of, of people that are actually interested in your event. So to pay Facebook, say $5 to essentially take your flyer and, and not just deliver it to a bunch of people, but deliver it to targeted people who are likely to be interested in your book reading or whatever you're doing, it's not that bad of a deal. And so, so we have those the two types of exposure um, and the way that those two types work and the way that they interplay is different on each platform. So once again, as we, uh, you know, next week we're gonna talk about Facebook, the week after that, we're gonna talk about Twitter and Instagram. So the way that that paid and organic exposure works is different. Finally, we need connection, right? And, and we have this connection ladder over here, which we can fill in. A little bit tonight. So we've talked about uh, your blog and your newsletter extensively. The last class series was all about getting those set up. And we're going to add a few things tonight. We're going to add our social media, which we're going to separate a little bit into Facebook. And then we're going to put Twitter and Instagram on the same line. And then up at the top here, we have genuine human interaction, GHI. So we're going to we're going to talk more about how we form connections on these things, um, but but we have these connections and the order of this ladder is important. Um, as we go up the ladder, the value of those connections increase. Uh, people that are Facebook friends are less likely to take action than people then that are on your newsletter list. People that are just on your newsletter list are less likely to take action than people that have had a genuine human interaction with you that have you know met you in person or or. You know, you, you work with them in some capacity. And so not all connections are created equal. And that'll be important as we move on. Um, you know, something that I'm going to say several times tonight is that social media followers for followers sake is pointless. All right. So just doing social media, just so that your follower count goes up so that you can say, I've got, you know, 5,000 fans on Instagram or whatever platform you're using is relatively worthless um, unless we're moving them up this ladder, unless we're taking... Uh, effective steps to, to increase their level of relationship and commitment with us on a consistent basis. So this is the growth triangle. And you guys in the class, I know that you have seen this many times. Any questions about this though, before we move on? All right, awesome. Now the second thing that I wanna talk about is your, your content collection engine. Um, this is so often where authors get bogged down um, in, in their social media stuff is they, they feel like they should create content. So, you know, once or twice or five times a week, they sit down at the computer and they think, oh, I've got to come up with something clever. 
you know, be clever, be clever, be clever. And, uh, and typically they, they produce content that doesn't have a lot of value and that takes an inordinate amount of time. Even if they do come up with something clever, uh, you know, to sit down and take three hours to come up with one Facebook post uh, that, that's a little bit clever isn't going to complete this uh, triangle with any efficiency. It's not going to get the job done. So we have to dramatically change the way that we're thinking about creating content. And in fact, I want you to stop creating content altogether. Instead, we're going to begin collecting content. So there are things in your life that you are doing all of the time that have value, that, that you can reformat to bring value to your audience. So instead of, of sitting down and thinking, I've got, to, I've got to create some content, we're just going to start looking at our life differently and start collecting content that already happens. So I want you to think about people that you follow on, on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, and, you know, people, not, not businesses necessarily, uh, but people. And the people that you most interact with, people that you look forward to seeing their stuff, they are very likely not ever sitting down and thinking, oh man, I got to come up with something to put on Facebook, right? But instead, they're taking pictures of things that are already happening around them. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're digesting the news and giving a hot take on it, things that they are already doing. And they never once sat down and thought, I've got to create some stuff. Instead, they've just changed the lenses of their life to look at things that they're already doing and to see those as shareable opportunities. Um, and so we're going to do the same thing. Um, so often, and this isn't just true for authors, this is true for large companies as well. So it's probably especially true for large companies that, uh, that we see this is how social media works, right? That, uh, you know, your, your friend Lindsay isn't, isn't creating content. She's not uh, manufacturing anything. Maybe she's a little bit, but most of this is stuff that's already happening in her life. And she's, you know, gaining all these fans. She's got a hundred likes on every picture and everything. She's, that's how she's interacting. And in fact, that's how all of your friends are interacting on some scale. But as soon as we come in as a company or as a brand or as a, as a professional personality, we think about advertising, right? And everything takes on this advertising type tone where we're going to tell you about something that you need to do. We're going to try to get you to take some action. And, and, and that, that will be a little bit of it. But mostly what we're going to do is we're going to look around and find the things that are already happening in our lives. Um, so we talked last week or a couple weeks ago, last time we met about the blog engine. Right, that you have this blog, and this is kind of going to be the powerhouse of all of the content that you create. And just like the, the engine in your car, you've got this, you know, your, your primary drivetrain or whatever it's called in the car, and that runs all kinds of peripheral equipment, right? It runs like the air conditioner and it runs the fan belt and all this stuff. And so we've got a few different things that are running off of our blog system. So we've got our Facebook that's running off of our blog. We've got our, uh, our Twitter or our Instagram running off of our blog and our mailing list also is running off of our blog. And instead of thinking about creating content for every single one of these things, we've got this belt that runs off the main drivetrain here that is gonna run all three of these different sprockets at the same time. And so rather than thinking, you know, sitting down and saying, I've gotta come up with something completely new and original for Facebook, we can create one blog on a consistent schedule, maybe once or twice per week, and then simply, for the most part, extrapolate and reformat that content to work on these other platforms. Um, so, uh, so some things, just as examples, that, that you are doing in everyday life that you can use to populate this blog uh, would be book reviews. If you are writing, you hopefully are reading, right? And, and so you're, you're reading all kinds of materials, you can review those materials to your blog um, and then extrapolate those out. So for instance, let's say you, um, I'm, uh, I'm reading the Lord of the Rings right now for the first time. Um, and, and so I'm reading that. And so, you know, eventually someday I'll be done with this book, um, but I can write a blog about my, uh, about my experience with Lord of the Rings. And then I can, first of all, I can just post a link about that blog post on Facebook, right? With maybe a little snippet. Uh, with some kind of hot take or some kind of short thing from my blog, some kind of tease or something. And I can post that on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, I can send out a, a mailing list letter about my blog review that, you know, tell my followers that they should come and, and, and read this book review. And then I can reformat that again. I can take a longer section of that and I can post that to Facebook, right? It's just standalone Facebook content, even though it's the same content that was here. And then I can take, you know, a few, you know, if I have some really clever insights or something like that, I can pull out a couple of sentences and I can schedule those throughout to populate uh, my, my Twitter account throughout the week. 
and so on and so forth. And so this is the way that that cycle happens. And, and we're going to go into, into great detail on exactly how you do that in a way that's not going to suck away all your life. Um, but, but we'll get to that. So book reviews uh, are one example. Events, uh, you know, you may not be there yet, but there will be a time when you are doing things as your author self and as your expert self. So, um, you know, Ethan, for instance, wants to do, uh, he's got this emphasis on, on dressing confidently, right? So he may be invited to speak at Fellowship of Christian Athletes at some high school about, you know, confidence and then how you dress and how you present yourself and things like that. And that's great content for his blog, both before and after. You know, he can be talking about, I'm going to do this thing. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Afterwards, he can share pictures and say, you know, this is what I talked about. And all that information can also then be redistributed to these other platforms. And he never once had to sit down and like come up with some new idea. He just took things that are already happening in his life. And so, so that events principle could apply to lots of different things. Third party stuff about you. Hopefully people, good and bad, will be talking about you in the future. Um, and so you have an opportunity to respond to that. If people leave reviews about your work or reactions to your blogs, um, you know, hopefully, like, like we've talked about with blogging, it's engaging in a conversation that's already happening. So if you're doing that effectively and you're talking to people that are talking, some of them should be talking back. And so that's, that's content that can be repurposed there. Um, a sample scene is great information for, for your blog. You know, a little section of your work in progress. And, you know, I've, I've encouraged you guys many times that your blog should never be about writing. Nobody cares about your writing process until you're famous. Uh, you know, there are so many writers writing about writing, uh, unsuccessful writers, I, I should specify, writing about writing. Um, it'll make you sick, and it, it's white noise. However, you know, if you have a work in progress, especially if it's something that, that you know, you're going deep on and you've researched and you want to share a scene from that, um, not to talk about your process, but just to share, you know, this is an entertaining scene. This scene in itself has value to you. Um, then that can be a great start there. And, and once again, that can spread out. Research. No matter what kind of book that you're writing, you are doing research, or you should be. Um, and if you're not doing research, then, it, then it's probably things that you already have, like a decent personal arsenal of information on. Um, if you're not doing any research, uh, th then you might want to look at how you can add depth and complexity to your book. Almost any genre should require research. But, you know, if you spend an hour reading about, uh, you know, the Grand Canyon this week because you're setting a scene in the Grand Canyon, you can, you can repurpose that hour, right? It's, it's not just time that was spent researching for the book now, but it's also time that, that goes into your blog. You know, you get this kind of dual purpose out of the same amount of time where some of that stuff that you learned, some, some new insights or whatever, you can post that to your blog and spread that uh, around your other sources. Not only that, it gives you an opportunity to, to mention your book and things. Once again, you're not talking about your process of writing, but you're like, here's some cool stuff I learned about the Grand Canyon while I was researching for my work in progress. Um, so devotional or revel revelational type stuff you come across. So, um, you know, and this could be true, whatever tradition that you're coming from, or even, you know, philosophical stuff that, you, that you're thinking about. You are standing in the shower sometimes, or you are doing the dishes, or you have quiet time in the morning, Whatever it is, hopefully you are growing as a person. You are gaining wisdom and insight and, and understanding. Um, and so some of that can make it to your blog. Um, let's see what else. So discoveries that you make. Hopefully, you know, you are you're being exposed to new materials all the time, whether that's out of research for your book or you're just, uh, you know, you're, you find a new road to the, route to the grocery store. That's, that would be terrible blog material. But, uh, but you are finding new things in your life all the time. And all that content can become fodder for your blog, um, which then gets repurposed for these other items. Uh, funny or interesting stories. I mean, if some funny things happen to you all the time. You know, you, you go home and you tell your spouse, you're not going to believe what happened. Or, you know, you're hanging out with your friends uh, on, on the weekend and you tell them this story about this thing that happened. If it's worth telling them and they laugh, it could be worth telling other people on your blog. Um, Let's see, things that inspire you or change your perspective. Hopefully you are, uh, you know, engaging some way with the world. And, uh, and that's things that you're already doing, right? I'm not saying that you need to go out and make time to read the news or something like that. But you are absorbing some kind of media, whether it's the news or movies or, or, or books we already talked about. But, but some kind of information is coming into your life. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, hopefully some of that is inspiring to you or is challenging for you. 
you can write about that. You can take that, that same time that you thought was wasted. You know, sometimes you're like, man, I'm sure wasting time on Facebook, right? But you, you see something and you just redeemed all that time, right? Because it's going to give you a reaction that you can now blog about and, and use to build out your personality. Um, and, and I do want to caution you in all that to stay away from politics, unless it's specifically part of the brand that you're building. Um, you know, we, we all want to talk about politics. Everybody seems like they're interested in that. But, but the fact is that you don't want a politically based audience unless, unless you're writing about politics. You know, if you're writing about fantasy and you are, let's say you're really for Donald Trump or you're really against Donald Trump, it, it doesn't matter why alienate half of your potential audience, right? You don't only want Trump loving fantasy lovers, right? If, if we have this diagram of people, people that love fantasy and people that love Trump, and you start talking about Trump, you just got rid of the rest of this fantasy circle in exchange for this small cross section, smaller cross section of people that love Trump and also love fantasy. So I strongly encourage you, no matter how, how tempting it is to resist the urge to go into partisan politics um, at all costs, unless you're writing political thrillers or you know, political research is somehow relevant to the book. That you're writing um, and you may be surprised you know sometimes we because we all live in these echo chambers right we, we think well this isn't controversial at all or we even worse we think i don't even want people who don't agree with me on this subject to to follow my page or to read my book and that's nonsense of course you do right of course we want people especially people who disagree with us to read our books and to read our blogs and to experience some of our values and perspective so and that's just a short list. So, so the list goes on and on and on. The point is that you are already doing things that give you material for your blog. So stop thinking about how am I going to sit down and create this stuff and just start opening your eyes to see what's already happening around you. And you'll see that you're already having great thoughts. You're already, uh, you know, potentially even wasting time now that could instead be an investment in, uh, in the material that you're creating. So I encourage you to uh, buy a little notebook uh, or, you know, you can start a note on your phone. I like to buy like a fancy little notebook, like a moleskin notebook or something like that, because I'm less likely to lose it. Um, and, it and it feels cool. It makes me feel artistic to write it. In. But as you're going about your daily routine, when you see something, when you have a thought, just go ahead and jot it down. Right. Or even if it's, even if it's not complete yet, um, and you can use that for, for notes about your book and your book and everything else as well. Um, but, but that way, when you go to sit down, you, you're not starting from scratch. You're not even thinking, oh, what did I do this week? But you pull out your notebook and you're like, oh, yeah, I had that interesting thought about, uh, you know, this topic on Thursday. That'd be great. You, you reformat the thoughts that you've already had for your blog and, and distribute it accordingly. And you've saved a ton of time. You've totally, you've totally changed your paradigm. And you've populated all these different things at the same time. So questions about any of that? Do you have um, some <clears throat> thoughts, Brad, about attention spans as they relate to the length of the blog? Yeah, absolutely. So in general, um, you know, my recommendation is that your blog should be 500 to 1500 words. Um, and the reason is that's like, it's like two to six minutes of reading. Um, you know, I've said this before, and it's, it's partially a joke, but it's mostly true. Your average blog reader is sitting on the toilet. Right, and so we want to um, we want to create a, an experience that can be completed in the same amount of time it takes to sit on the toilet, um, and, and so so that's really a great starting point. There is some research that that suggests that longer blogs are better, but really it's all about value, right? It's all about how much space do you need to succinctly bring value, and keeping in mind that our audience's attention span is always shorter than we think it is. Um, all of these things, blog, your social media, your mailing list. We have the least captive audiences in the history of the world. You know, you come into church and you sit down and you're going to listen to the pastor, right? Unless something is like really, really off, you're probably going to stay to the end. So the pastor just has to say something good enough by the end of that thing. However, on, uh, on, on the internet, that, that's not true at all. As soon as we start losing someone's attention, they're out of there, right? They're on to the next thing in your feed. They're kicking back and finding something else to read. So we definitely want to be aware of attention spans. Um, shorter is typically better, but the question is, how long does it take to really bring them value? Um, because we don't just want the, we don't just want to get the click and get the read. Our goal is to generate organic exposure so that we can increase their level of connection, right? So we write that we write a great blog and we share it on Facebook. 
and uh, you know, Joe Facebook user loves it. And so they click love and they share it to their friends. Their friends all go read the blog. Uh, where you have, you know, the solicitation, hey, you like this, join my newsletter, and they sign up for the newsletter and increase the relationship with you, um, and, and so, so you get new people that way. So it, it's really important that that we're finding the link that brings value, and that's probably going to be a little bit different for everybody. Um, you know, some people have found a lot of success with writing lots of short blogs for the week. Other people, um, you know, write one one long one that has a, has a lot of meat to it. Uh, so it's going to be partially your personality, but as a rule of thumb, 500 to 1500 words is a great place to start. Um, it's also notable that, uh, and, and we're gonna, once again, we're gonna talk about each platform individually and go into a lot of detail there, but we do need to reformat our content for each of these purposes. Um, you know, there, there are definitely a lot of places where we can copy and paste. However, each of these platforms, Facebook and Twitter are very different places. They're different, not just because of the technical limitations or the way that things display, although that's very important, but they also have different cultures, right? So the audiences that are on each of these places have different expectations about uh, kind, of, kind of your attitude and your tone and the way that you're interacting. And so we need to take that into account. Um, and, and so there are a lot of services out there uh, like Hootsuite, for instance, that um, advertise, you know, Put your content in this one place and then we'll distribute it to all your channels and it's really convenient and, and it is very convenient however typically we lose a, a lot of impact that way so if it's worth posting on both facebook and twitter it's worth taking the time to, to change it just slightly to fit those platforms in the way that's going to be uh, most effective for each one of those other questions all right Cool. Um, all right, and then then the last piece I want to share about this content collection idea is that you don't have to create content. You barely even have to collect content. Um, so everything that we've been talking about so far, you know, you collect things from your everyday life, things that you're already doing as part of who you are as an author and a person, and, and reformat that, and that's great. But there's this other piece where where Everyone else in the world is also creating content. And you can share that content through your pages. You can even share a lot of that content through your blog. Um, and you don't have to lift a finger to create it. Some of the most successful Facebook pages in the world don't, and, and Instagram pages and Twitter accounts don't create any content at all. They just aggregate content from other sources, right? So they're, they're following a bunch of pages and the stuff that they find the funniest or the most poignant or or most challenging or whatever their kind of personality is, they simply share that to their page. And you know, the consumer loves that because someone else is doing the work of sorting through all this content and just giving them the best stuff. So you can be that person to somebody else. Um, and, and so when you're, when you're spending time on Facebook or Twitter, wherever you spend time, um, it, it's not just about you know, inspiring yourself with, with some idea that you're gonna write about, um, but you can also just directly share that content. And that's going to have a lot of value for your audience. Um, and, I, and I think that that's something that we often overlook. Um, so, you know, there, there are a few great ways to do that, but that's also an excellent way to have people help you. Um, my wife, she has an Instagram account and she's been posting. Um, it started with like toilet paper memes from eight weeks ago, right? For the coronavirus thing. There are all these funny memes about people hoarding toilet paper. And so she just starts posting them on her Instagram story. Before long, all of her friends are sending her the funniest memes that they find. And then she's just posting them. And she, so she has, you know, almost no work to do in this situation other than, you know, people are sending her funny things and she sorts through them and posts the ones that she thinks are the best. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are a lot of good ways to, to make that work in your favor. Um, taking into account your personality and how you presently use social media. Um, but people can absolutely work on your behalf in, in that regard. And, and you will bring value to your audience, even though you created none of it at all. So don't overlook that part of it. All right, so, so how does this whole system work? Um, so, so I already gave the example of a, of a book review, but let's go into a little more depth there. So um, let's say you read a book and you go ahead and, and write a review about it and post it on your blog. Great, that, that's a good thing to do. That's, that's good content for the world anyways. It helps people to find books that they'll love and enjoy. So you do that and then you post it on Facebook and you tag the author. Hey, I wrote, I read Hagrid by at Samuel Snoke Brown. 
And, uh, and so you, you post that and you've got you know, a couple sentences with a link to your blog. Sam, who is a friend of mine, sees that post because he's been tagged. And he's like, hey, this person left a positive, positive review. So he goes and shares that with his audience, right? He just clicks the share button and, and drops that over on, on his author page. And now, I mean, he doesn't have a huge number of followers, but he's got some, right? He's got, I don't know, a thousand people or something maybe. And so he, he shares that content to, to his thousand people. And now you have organic exposure. Um, and so those, some of those people will go ahead and click on the blog and they'll go ahead and read it. And some of them will decide to connect with you. Either you know they'll like the page that they saw this coming from, or they'll sign up for your newsletter, or they'll find some way to do that as long as there are, there are clear ways for them to do that. Some of them will then share it again, right? And so you get more exposure. Um, and theoretically, that's where viral content comes from, right? It's content that is being organically shared over and over and over again, like a virus. Um, and, and so, so you have this system now where you wrote some content and you tag one person and, and you create a, a cycle that's going to repeat itself over and over. And of course, that's a, um, that's a best case scenario, right? That doesn't always happen. Lots of times we write a book review and we tag the author and like nobody cares, right? But, but your audience reads it. Maybe some of them appreciate and get value from it. So it's, it's, it's not like it was a terrible thing to do, but that can happen as well. Um, but when you're doing book reviews, it's important to spend time reading small press and indie literature because those are the people that are likely to complete this cycle for you. It's also good for the, you know, the literary industry as well, uh, the publishing industry to do that. But, uh, you know, if you write a book review and, and post it on Facebook about a Dean Koontz novel that you read, you tag Dean Koontz. Dean Koontz doesn't care, right? Dean Koontz is getting tagged a thousand times a day for all kinds of different reasons. <clears throat> and he, he doesn't need your help promoting his books. So he, he doesn't really care. Um, you know, that's going to go largely ignored. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Doesn't mean it doesn't bring some value to this engine. If you already invested the time reading the book and you can take 20 minutes to, to tap out a review. Um, so it's not bad, but, it, but it's less likely to do that. <laughs> Whereas if you read materials by, you know, small press and indie presses and things like that, you're more likely to find those connections that are going to be really excited that you bothered to write a review and post it. And they are going to help you complete that, that cycle. Um, so uh, another example would be a research article. Um, so let's say that you, uh, the Grand Canyon, you research the Grand Canyon for this scene in your book, and you'd already put in the time, you know, reading all the Wikipedia pages and, and looking through the internet of photos and things like that. So you go ahead and digest some of that into your blog. You share some photos that you have permission to, to share on your blog. Didn't really take that much time to convert that, that stuff that you already did into your blog. And then you post it on Facebook and, uh, and maybe you tag, you know, uh, the Grand Canyon National Park or whatever it's called. Maybe they share it, but maybe they don't. But in any case, you're, you're putting this content out to your Facebook audience who are going to see it. They're going to find that you already went to this trouble to uh, aggregate a bunch of really nice photos of the Grand Canyon. They picked up some factoids that they can share around the coffee pot tomorrow morning. And they want to look like they, they are smart or like they are um, you know, ecologically invested or something. So they, they share that content to their Facebook friends once again, and then that begins the cycle again. Um, uh, as in one more example uh, would be if you did uh, like a devotional series um, or a recipe series. So, you know, every Wednesday you post a recipe or every, uh, every Friday you post, you know, four news articles that, uh, that, opened your eyes to something or changed the way you think or something like that, but some kind of recurring series. Um, you know, you can, you, you post, put that content in your blog. It's, it's stuff you're already doing anyways. Um, you're already cooking for your family. So finding one recipe and, and uh, you know, reformatting that to be your own and doing, you can do that with integrity. Um, it's not that big of a deal anyway. So you post that stuff on your blog and then you share that to your social media and you send out your, your mailing list uh, your newsletter about that blog that you just posted and uh, you know people find value in that people get used used to you know connecting with you every Wednesday evening for a new recipe or every Friday morning for some kind of inspirational devotional or something like that and they begin to they're, they're finding value in it and so at some point they'll naturally begin to um, give you exposure they'll naturally begin to share that as they continue to see more and more value and for all of those examples, uh, we can also use paid exposure to boost it even further. 
So whatever we're seeing with, with a little bit of organic reach, we can throw five bucks at Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and uh, make that content go even further. All right, any, any questions? Great. Uh, once again, if you're watching on Facebook, I can't see if you have questions. So um, you're welcome to send me a message later on and I'll do my best. Um, but this is just a preview so that you can see what's going on. Ethan, welcome to the class. How are you doing? You feeling better? All right, cool. All right, so this is the, the review of the paradigm that, we, that we've talked about. So let's talk about the purpose of social media generally before we get started. Um, as I already mentioned, the purpose of social media is not to get more followers. Social media followers are this close to worthless, um, just as, as social media followers. Um, now there is value in, in being able to demonstrate an audience. So um, let's say for instance, that you, you release a book and you are looking for opportunities to be a guest on podcasts. There is value in that podcast host being able to look up uh, Mark Bear. And they see, oh, well, Mark Bear has 5,000 followers on Facebook, so he must be okay, right? And so that can kind of provide, that can kind of open the gate for you. So, so there's some value there. But the danger in all social media followers is that they can give us a false confidence in the size of people that care about us. Um, and the problem is that it takes so little investment for someone to like your Facebook page, right? It's, it's super easy to like a page. And it's super easy to unlike a page. So, so somebody, you know, they see something that's marginally interesting, they can go ahead and like the page until you annoy them and then unlike the page. Um, whereas with a newsletter, when somebody is giving you their email address, they have a little bit of investment, right? They're, they're sacrificing a little bit of their privacy because they're already finding value in what you do. Um, so I've talked to so many authors over the years who have, you know, some kind of social media following. And usually, you know, they spend a lot of time earning lots of content that they've put out in the world earning a Facebook following or an Instagram following. And so they say, well, I've got like, you know, 10,000 followers on Facebook. So I figure that's, and, and they always have some number in mind, you know, something that they've calculated, a thousand books sold right there. Uh, you know, some of them are like, I've got a thousand followers. So that's like a thousand books sold, right? Unfortunately, no. Um, realistically, if you can get 1% of your social media followers to take action on your behalf, that'd be a really, really good day, especially action that involves spending their money. Um, so simply generating uh, social media followers just to have them isn't worthwhile. You know, you shouldn't be investing any time and money if that's the end of your strategy because it just won't pay off. Uh, like we talked about, our goal is to move them up this chain so that they become more invested in the relationship and they become more likely to take action when you need them to take action. Um, I want you to think about yourself as if you are recruiting an army, right? And this is a volunteer army. People can come and go whenever they leave. And your goal is to develop, to develop this army so that when you release your book, you can say, army, this is your mission. This is what I need. I need you to buy the book. I need you to review it. I need you to tell three friends about it, right? And the question is, how many of your army are invested enough to actually do that? Um, and so we want to we wanna just completely do away with that idea of, wow, I, I feel good about myself because I have X number of social media followers. Our goal is to generate relationships through bringing value to people. This is really the, the crux of it right here is as long as you're bringing value to people, people are gonna naturally move up that chain, right? Even if you don't try hard. Now, now if you do try hard, if you also uh, in include reasonable solicitations and invitations to move up the list, it's gonna go even better. But as long as you're providing value to people, you're gonna move up that, up that list to connect meaningfully. Um, I want to talk to you about a rule that we have in relational content marketing. So social media is relational content marketing. We are creating content for the purpose of marketing, and, and we do that by building relationships, right? So it's, it's relational content marketing. And that's the 1990 rule. And uh, if you've heard of the 80-20 rule, this is kind of Kind of a similar thing. Um, and it's actually cool to see how it plays out. So, so the idea is that in any large social system, like an organization or a, a social media audience or a protest or a crowd of some kind, this is what you're going to have. You're going to have 1% of people that are actors, that they're making things happen, they're creative, they're engaged, they're, they're bringing new stuff to the table. 
you're gonna have 9% of the crowd that are reactors. They're not really bringing anything new, but they're there to readily engage with whatever's happening. And then you get 90% of people that are just kind of hanging out, right? And you're kind of like, why are you even here? But, but they are there and they're just hanging out. And so on your social media, for instance, um, when, you, when you post something, you have 1% of people that are going to leave a comment, right? Or they're gonna share it with, uh, with some additional comments on the, of, of their own on that. Um, but they're gonna, they're gonna engage in a creative way with this. 9% of the people that see this theoretically are gonna interact with it in some other way, right? They're either gonna hit a like or a love or a sad or an angry, or they're gonna share it or retweet it or something like that. They're not really bringing anything new to the table. They're just interacting with what you have. And then 90% of it, they're gonna see it. And even if they like it, they're not really gonna take any action, but they saw it, they were there. Um, so you see this, uh, I mean, churches are great examples of this. Uh, you know, if you have a church with, uh, let's say 200 people in it, very likely about 1% of the population of that church is engaging creatively. They're creating new stuff, they're bringing new stuff to the table. So that's like a couple people in a church of 200, right? That are, they, they've got some idea for a new group or they wanna do some kind of event or outreach or something like that. You've got 9%, maybe 20-ish people who are willing to do this stuff. They just don't have anything new to bring to the table. But if you tell them, hey, I need you to teach this class or I need you to show up and make pancakes here or I need you to lead this small group, they're gonna do that. They're gonna engage that way. But then you got 90% of the population, you know, maybe roughly 180 people who are just kind of there, right? And then they come, they show up to stuff when the doors are open. Maybe they come to a small group or an event or something like that, but they're really not bringing anything at all, but they're just kind of around. And so interestingly, those numbers play out, you know, whether the church has 200 people or whether the church has 5,000 people and you've got 50 creators and you've got 500 people who are willing to show up and do this stuff and 4,500 people that are just hanging around. And, and so this is a really interesting way to kind of break down audiences. And there are two ways that we can use this. Um, the first way is to assess our present results. Um, and what I mean by that is if you're seeing, uh, you know, whatever you're seeing, uh, whatever number of people you're seeing interact with your content, there are roughly 10 times that many that are just kind of hanging around. So if you are, you know, you post something that, that you believe has value and you see 15 people interact with it in some way, you know, they share it or they, they like it or heart it or whatever the thing is, that means that you probably got about, you know, 150 people who saw it, had a similar reaction, but just chose to take, chose to take no action at all. And, and so this is helpful because, you know, you're, when, when you log into Facebook, for instance, you're going to see all these results like, oh, you know, 40 people interacted and 1,200 people saw it. Unfortunately, that 1,200 people saw it really doesn't have a lot of value, right? There are a lot of different ways that people can see it. Maybe they just you know, zipped past it really quick. Maybe they were looking for something else and saw it on accident. So, so that 1,200 people isn't really valuable. So sometimes it's more useful to say, well, 40 people interacted with it. So I bet about 400 people saw it in some meaningful way. So we can use it that way. But more importantly is that it's a rule that we can try to break. Um, so we want to create content that has so much value that these nine percenters, these reactors are inspired to become actors. And so that these lurkers are inspired to become reactors or maybe even actors. So, you know, this content is, has so much emotional impact on somebody or so much value to them that normally they don't, they don't hit the like button. They are lurking on Facebook, which probably many, many of you that are watching, you're just, you're just lurkers. Right, but, but you see something that just has so much value to you that you're like, I gotta share this, right? And so you start acting like somebody up here. Or you know, if, if you are somebody that routinely hits the like or the share button, that you're like, not only am I gonna share this, but I'm gonna say, you know, this is, this is the best thing that I've ever seen. This has so much value to me in, in some capacity. And so we can use this to try and, to try and break it. And, uh, and that's a great indicator. You know, you can, you can kind of put up garbage and expect to see something like this happen, right? Because people, people are lazy, you know, they're already following you. So they're like, yeah, yeah, like, like, you know, there are 9% of people that are just like, oh yeah, everything that comes across their feed, unless it's like terribly offensive, they're gonna click like. Um, so, so a lot of times we can achieve this with a lot of effort, without a lot of effort rather, um, but we wanna create content that has enough value that, that breaks this rule. So that's what we look for. You know, we, we posted something on the School of Kingdom Writers 
Facebook page the other day and it got like 1200 impressions and 400 interactions, right? So 400 people, and I don't know which of these categories they belong in, but in some capacity, they either clicked a like button or they shared it or they didn't done something with it. So out of 1200, so our, our metric for that looks more like a 30% between these two and then 70% learners. So we knew that that was really valuable content. And so as you're going out there into the world, and, uh, and this is gonna be true for your blog, you know, if you see 100 people visit your blog, you might have one comment, right? And, and so you can use that both ways. If you see one comment, you can kind of think, well, I bet I have to have about 100 people. Um, but if you're able to break that rule, then that's what you wanna lean into, right? You might be posting and posting and posting, and then, you know, you do something different. You decide I'm gonna I'm gonna just use my research about the Grand Canyon this time and and share other people's pictures with permission, of course. And suddenly you are blowing this through the roof, and that tells you, okay, this is a this is an objective that I can lean into and find value in. Um, I've said this in, in previous classes, but since we're moving into social media, I do want to repeat this: that it's important that you don't overextend yourself on social media because consistency is so important for your content. So as we've talked about, I think that you need a website, you need a blog where you 100% control the content and you 100% control the experience. I think that Facebook is very important because Facebook is such a massive community. You know, after Google and YouTube, I think Facebook is the next largest search engine. So if people are, are looking for, you know, they heard about this author named Ethan Clark, they're gonna to go to Facebook and they're gonna search in Ethan Clark and, and, and see what comes up. So you need to have a presence there. And then I encourage you to have one other presence. I think that the, that the best candidates are either Twitter or Instagram and, and a big factor in determining which one would be your personality and your bent as far as, you know, if you like taking pictures or writing short sentences about things. Um, but, but those are great platforms because they're also the next largest across basically all demographics, you know, young people, old people everybody. But if you wanted to substitute one of these for another platform, if there's somewhere that you naturally feel like you understand it, and then you have a good pulse of the culture, you already know how to interact and discuss with people like Snapchat or LinkedIn, or, you know, any of those others, you could absolutely substitute this next tier for one of those platforms. But I encourage you to, to then limit yourself there. Just stop. I think that there's this tremendous pressure to um, always be expanding, right? People come along or you go to a conference or you know, go to your writer's group or whatever and people are like, oh, I'm on, uh, I'm on you know, this Periscope or whatever. And you're like, oh, I gotta get a Periscope. That's where the action is. You know, Doug's on Periscope and he's got 5,000 followers on there. I gotta get on Periscope. And, and so we're continually just kind of chasing our tail going after this thing instead of investing heavily into a few specific uh, platforms that match our personality. So choose right now what uh, what fits and then stick with it. And the other reason before we move on that I recommend Twitter or Instagram or, or potentially LinkedIn is that these guys are pretty solid by now. You know, there are always new platforms that are popping up and they have their moment in the sun, but then typically they get absorbed by somebody else. Their functionality gets absorbed by somebody else. So I mentioned Periscope just a minute ago. Periscope started, um, I don't know, maybe maybe five years ago now. And for like 18 months, it was cool, right? Because you could do live video and you couldn't do live video anywhere else. However, 18 months in, Facebook launches a live video platform and suddenly Periscope is, is basically obsolete. I mean, there's still some people on it now, but Facebook, uh, you know, they have the, the resources to do it better than Periscope. And so everybody just used that functionality there. So, uh, you know, one of the dangers uh, of social media is the side the fact that these followers really aren't a lot of good to you um, when, when it comes to actually taking action, if we're not being intentional about how we move them up the relational ladder, is that your content isn't portable, right? So if you, uh, if you spend hours and hours and hours building this audience on Periscope and, and creating great content on Periscope and just putting all your time and money and effort into that, and then Periscope, you know, dropped off the map, whether they go bankrupt or people just stop caring, there's no way to take those 5,000 followers and like, import them into Facebook or like automatically dump them into your newsletter list. There's no way to take that content on there and move that somewhere else. Um, and so we want to be careful about uh, in investing in, in social media. So, so I recommend these because they've been around a long time. I think that they have the clout and the resources that, you know, whatever these, whatever somebody else is doing, they will absorb that in time. Um, Brad, 
Yeah. You did uh, mention LinkedIn, and of course, I have a presence there. Yeah. But um, it seems like an extremely specialized platform, much more so than um, any of the others that you've mentioned. And I would think that it would um, only be suitable for very well-defined kinds of content. I mean, people who have business and professional interests and really nothing else. Yeah, yeah, you're generally right. Um, and so I would only use LinkedIn, one, if you have a really big presence there already. Um, just like your expertise, you know, your, your expertise might be about pigeons. That's an absurd example, of course, but it might be about pigeons. And even though you're writing an adventure book that has very little to do about pigeons, there's some crossover between those, right? So you build this pigeon audience, and then when you release your book, you do have some people there that, that like both pigeons and your book topics. So you have this kind of a little bit captive audience that you can talk to. And the same could be true of LinkedIn, um, you know, where, where even though that is something that's functioning in a completely different capacity, you know, you're mostly talking about your professional um, stuff and, and whatnot there, you could find an audience there that crosses over. Um, and, and so if you, if you already understand that world and you feel like you can, you can generate an audience there, like that's going to be a better investment of your time. I, I'm not against that. And um, I, honestly, the, the same things can be true of Twitter and Instagram. You know, there are very specific types of people that go on those platforms. And so we can make a similar argument that's like, what do people that like sharing pictures have to do with people that like potentially reading books? And the truth is largely probably not a lot, but there is enough crossover. There are enough people that share both of those interests that you can potentially connect with to make it worthwhile for you. I guess there is one argument in a way for LinkedIn, even if it's not conducive to the kind of stuff that I'm involved in now. And that is that I have like 500 relationships you sure. know, there. And you know, some of them I think would be interested in in reading stuff that I write, even yeah. though it's not aligned with their professional interests. Sure, and the nature of your specific audience might change the way that you try to move people up the chain, right? There could be you have these five hundred connections on LinkedIn, and you're feeding them content, and and they kind of like it, and so you might skip some of these things, and maybe there's an opportunity to be a guest speaker at their next conference or at their next. Uh, you know, you know to, be a, to be a speaker at their next uh, all staff meeting or something like that. And so you, that would be part of my consideration as you approach that is, okay, maybe, maybe there's a different next step that makes sense. Um, but the important thing is, are we able to identify a next step that is gonna work, that is gonna make this relationship deeper, have more value and more, more effect for you? Um, and how do you, how do you gear the invitations and solicitations to get people there? Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. So I want to talk uh, real briefly about how social media works. Uh, and I think that this will prevent a lot of heartache for you. So social media is a business. Social media specifically is a publishing business. So Facebook is a publisher. Now I own a publishing company and in that publishing company, people submit their manuscripts to me. And if I like it, if I feel like it has values that I want to put into the world, if I feel like it's going to meet my objectives, which in my case include, you know, it matches values and ideas I want to put into the world and it's likely to be profitable, then I go ahead and invest work in it to distribute that. Facebook functions exactly the same, except on a different scale. Um, and the big difference is that you, the author, the content creator, are working for free. So Facebook has, as a publisher, has every right to, to choose what kind of content they want to distribute. And just like my publishing company, Facebook has a set of values um, and they probably heavily include profit, but they can also include social or political values. And they, Facebook has, has the prerogative to uh, distribute materials that, that fulfill those functions for them. Um, and this can be really, really challenging. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that's, that that's right, um, that that doesn't need to be examined, how that's working or anything like that, but that is the situation today. And so on any social media platform, um, we have this idea of free speech. And free reach. Free speech is the idea that you can say whatever you want to say. Free reach is the idea that 
Facebook or whatever platform is actually going to show what you said to anybody. And the fact is that on every social media platform that I'm aware of, you don't have either one of these things, right? You are not permitted to say anything that you want. And even if you were, Facebook isn't going to necessarily show it to everyone. Um, and, and so Facebook has the prerogative that, that they can let you say this, this opinion that they disagree with. It doesn't represent their values, but they're not necessarily going to make that appear on anyone else's timeline. And, and so you will run into this. You will absolutely run into situations where you post content that you think has value um, and it just doesn't go anywhere, right? It just doesn't get any reactions at all. And what you'll eventually find is that Facebook is limiting your free reach for some reason that, uh, that we will probably never know. But you're gonna go into the statistics and you can see like seven people saw this. You know, I've got a thousand followers and seven people saw this content. Um, but, but that is Facebook's right to do that. It is a private company right now. Um, you know, but, but we are working as free authors at Facebook's pleasure. So as long as we're valuable to them, they will distribute our content. But when we stop being valuable to them, they won't. Um, and, I, and a lot of people don't re realize that. That's true if you're a business or if you're an author. It's true if you sit down for two hours and think of something super clever and exciting that you're going to put out in the world or whether uh, you know, you're just sharing pictures of your kids. When you share pictures of your kids, Facebook distributes that content because they know that your friends and family are gonna like those things, they're gonna comment, they're gonna interact, they're gonna come back and see what other people said. And all of those views, all that interaction is an opportunity to sell advertisements. And so, um, so I just want you to keep that in mind, that that is the situation that you are partaking in so um, instead of being frustrated, just, just understand that you are working for free and the payment that you get is the opportunity to talk to new people, is this opportunity for exposure. All right, so let's talk about some specifics. I wanna talk about profile photos because this is your homework for this week. Um, starting next week, we're gonna dig into specific platforms. We're gonna walk through the process of setting up your professional pages in the right way and setting up the professional tools in the right way. Um, and it's gonna save you so much time and so many headaches. Um, you know, each of these platforms that we talked about, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, has, has professional tools available that are gonna make your life easier and are going to eliminate distractions. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems with Facebook, for instance, is you log in to post something. And then before you know it, it's like an hour and a half later and you're knee deep in a heated debate about air fryers or something, right? And so, but there are tools available where you can skip all that nonsense and you can just go straight to posting and straight to doing the work that you need to do. Um, so we're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. And your homework is to prepare uh, profile photos and cover photos um, so that we can walk through that process together. So your profile photo, let me, let me clear a little space here. Your profile photo and your cover photo on, on every platform is gonna be cropped in different ways for different purposes. Um, so when we talked about building your website, we talked about how your website shows up differently on a laptop computer than it does on a phone, or on a, shows up differently on a tablet. Even between two different laptop computers, there'll be differences in the way that things are displayed. And so the same is true on social media. Um, so on, on different device sizes, different, different methods of display, um, you're gonna see that your photo is cropped differently. So the important thing that we need to do is create photos that are going to crop nicely no matter where they, where they land. Um, so the, the profile photos are fairly easy. It just needs to be square. So it doesn't matter what the specific dimensions are. I recommend 500 plus pixels. And really the bigger the better. I mean, it doesn't have to be absurd, but if you can get 3000 by 3000 pixels, on a square photo, that's awesome. That'll give you plenty of room to shrink down and still maintain your quality and things. But here's the kicker. So in some instances, the center of this is gonna be cropped into a circular photo. So you need to make sure that like your face is dead center in the middle of that thing and that there's nothing important over in these corners that if it got cut off, you're, you're gonna lose something. So your face, like if your face was taking up the whole thing, that's gonna be bad. So you wanna, you wanna make sure that, that your pretty little face is right here in the middle. That's you, that's Ethan. So you're welcome, Ethan. Uh, it is right here in the middle with plenty of background around the outside so that it can get cut off. Um, for your profile photo, 
I recommend using your face. People like to think that they're they're talking to a specific individual. And that's a little different actually between Facebook and Twitter, but nonetheless, it's true for this part that uh, having your face as your profile photo makes sense. So I want you to find some profile photo, probably one where you're looking at the camera or at least where you're facing forward. Uh, please don't be too artistic about it. Please nothing with like the back of your head or like a veil over your face or something like that. You're not Banksy. Um, just, be, just be a regular person that somebody would like to have a conversation with. Um, so that's a square photo for that. But let's talk about cover photos for just a minute. And I'm gonna pull you up on my, uh, on my computer so I can share my screen with you. So give me just one moment to make a transition here. All right, so this is roughly the dimensions of a, a Facebook cover photo. So just like everything else, uh, your Facebook cover photo and let me actually let me go ahead and pull up a, uh, a Facebook page so you can just to make sure that we are all exactly on the same page here before I, I keep talking. All right, so when I'm talking about profile and cover photos, this, uh, this image over here, that's me in the circle looking vaguely off into the distance, that's my profile photo. And then this over here is my cover photo. Um, we'll see the same type of thing on Twitter. I have a profile photo here and I have a cover photo here. Note that my profile photo on a desktop display is partially covering my cover photo. That's going to be important later. Um, and so this is going to be roughly the same on most platforms at this point. Most, most of them are using a profile photo and, and cover photo kind of schema. All right, so the profile photo is easy. It's just got to be square, but once again, with the corners that can be cut off. Um, but let's look at the cover photo because it, it's a little trickier. So depending on the display type, so this red box is how your cover photo is going to appear, appear on a large display, like a, like a desktop screen or a laptop screen. And the blue box- We can't box, see that yet. Oh, you can't see it. Thank you for letting me know, Chris. That's, <laughs> that's helpful. Ethan and Mark let me talk for like 20 minutes once without, without telling me that they couldn't see my screen. All right, <laughs> so, okay, so this is just Photoshop. I just threw this together in order to show you um, what this looks like. So the red box there is how, is the roughly the dimensions or the aspect ratio of a Facebook cover photo on a desktop computer. And the blue box is roughly the aspect ratio on a, um, on a phone or on a tablet. And so to give you those specific dimensions that we're gonna, that we're gonna be talking about, write this down. I mean, you can, you can look it up again later as well, but you might as well just write it down now. The, uh, the, the wider photo for desktops is 820 pixels by 312 pixels. That's 820 by 312. And the smaller blue box, the narrower blue box is 640 pixels by 360 pixels. That's 640 by 360. And so you can make your, your cover photo larger than that. In fact, I usually double those pixels uh, when I actually make the cover photo, um, but that's the aspect ratio that you need to be working with. So the biggest problem that, or the biggest mistake that people make with their cover photos is they make them too busy. Uh, let me give you an example. So this is uh, something that I grabbed off of, um, I just searched for cover photos and so I found one that works. So I'm not picking on anybody, but um, so this one, they tried to incorporate a bunch of text into their cover photo. But the problem is that you can see that uh, once it, so this would be idealized for the blue box, but unfortunately there it cuts off the sides, right? Because there's, there's just too much stuff going on. And then if I, uh, if I reverse it here, Into the other one, um, we can see that, that it looks good. But once again, uh, on the smaller version, it's gonna it's gonna cut off. So so either way you go, you're gonna lose some of that content on one display or another, and it's also gonna look really unprofessional. So uh, a much better approach is to just grab something simple. So here's one that I grabbed online. This is just a a stock photo, with like the first thing up on Pixabay.com today. But uh, you know, this is just a general landscape oriented photo of some scenery. So 
I would assume in this case that, that you would be the woman there if you're using this as your uh, Facebook cover. Ethan, it would be weird if you use this. So find something else. All right. And uh, but, but you can see that there's the, the content. I mean, it gives a general tone. It gives an impression. Um, it it kind of tells somebody about who I am probably, but it doesn't have a lot of critical stuff. We can cut off the sides that way and we don't lose anything. And we can cut off the top and bottom this way and we don't lose anything. Either way, it still looks like a good picture. So um, I recommend uh, photos of landscapes that kind of represent who you are. So, you know, if you're a farm person, go with that. If you love it at the lake, go with that. Skylines and city parks also work. So if you're an urban dweller or an urban minded person, this doesn't necessarily preclude you. Um, skylines work awesome. Um, but then, you know, just, uh, just, just keep in mind that uh, you don't even have to go into a lot of depth with the specific dimensions. Just when you're looking at a whole photo, I want you to think, what would happen if, uh, if a bunch of this got cut off, right? If we lost the top and bottom of this or the sides, and will it still capture what I'm looking for? Um, is it still going to work? And you also have some opportunity to play with that in Facebook. So you take Facebook and, and other, uh, every platform that I'm aware of has tools that'll help you to actually crop it. And you can, of course, look at it and change it again. Um, so nothing is set in stone. It's still the internet. Um, but, but that's what you're looking for as far as your cover photo. All right. So that is your homework for next week is to uh, find a profile picture and to find a cover photo that are going to work for you. And we're going to walk through each of these platforms. Next week will be Facebook. Uh, the third week of this series will be Twitter and Instagram. And then we'll move on to some other things from there. Um, and so put that together and I will uh, we'll, we'll get started on that next week. So at this point, I want to take a break. Um, let's take 10 minutes and then we're going to come back and uh, we're going to walk through Google Analytics. Uh, so we had a lot of questions about how to make that work in your WordPress site. So um, we'll just go ahead and walk through that whole setup process. So go ahead and take 10 minutes, uh, do whatever you got to do, and we'll come back. And I'm going to talk to the people that are watching on Facebook Live for just a moment. So I'll see you guys that are in our uh, private group here in just a minute. All right, so if you are watching on Facebook Live, thanks for watching. Um, this is the, the first class in our next series, which is all about social media, as I'm sure you picked up by now. So if you want to keep going with us, we'd love to have you join us. Um, the next part of the class is mostly going to be kind of cleaning up some loose ends from the last class series. So you, so you won't really miss much. Um, you know, while, while the whole class definitely builds on each one, you, you can jump in at any point, and it's not like you're going to feel left out or like you don't have all the information you need. So go to classes.ohiowriters.org if you want more of this. So if you found this valuable, um, if, if this is going to kind of set your mind right and help you to see the light at the end of the tunnel and make progress, um, please come along with us for this journey. Um, now the classes aren't free, but I, but I think they have more value than what you're paying for and they absolutely will pay off. They're going to pay off in a platform that actually works. They're going to pay off in a ton of saved time and frustration. Um, you know, and that's, that's the number one thing I hear about people when, when I'm consulting with them as far as how to use their social media is like, I put all this time into it and it just doesn't work or I feel like it just distracts me all the time and I get frustrated. So it's going to be about how to use the tools, but then also how to develop the right headspace so that you can um, move forward in a healthy way that's going to be efficient and productive for you. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, you can send us a message on Facebook, or you can email me and uh, brad at ohiowriters.org or brad at sokw.org and I'd love to chat with you. So thanks for watching.